Omar, Jason, hey, I think you're maybe you muted. I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me. Oh, I hear you now. I hear you. Now. Okay, great. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was really, really fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's those colorful bridges. They're just simply incredible. That's so cool. I, I didn't notice, but they change colors, right? Yeah, it's all LEDs, so they're constantly moving and changing colors. So it's That's quite really nice cool. just to kind of do like a time lapse just to kind of see it. Yeah, I saw that. Everything. I was like, whoa, those are changing. That's really cool. Hey, there's Matt. You're out of focus, Matt. Yeah, I'm not sure why. Filter. I'll figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> So cool. Well, I'm just going to sort of get started. You guys feel free to share, as I said, share your video or not, share your microphones or not. Um, I am Kirsty Scott. I'm the publisher of Beachcombing Magazine. Um, the first, uh, just a few little housekeeping things. Um, keep your uh, microphones on mute unless you're talking, just because we don't want to have echoes. If you have headphones, that works great. Um, so you can have everything turned on forever. Um, you can ask a question by just unmuting your microphone and shouting out your question to Jason. Or if you'd rather, you can um, just, there's a little chat bubble thing at the bottom of the screen. You can click there and type in your question. And uh, Matt is gonna be sort of monitoring those, but you know, if he doesn't get to you say, hey, I have a question. Um, we're recording this, parts of it may be made available depending how much time we have. But um, this event is made possible by Beachcombing Club, which is a group of people who support the creation of this unique content live stream events. You can learn more about it on beachcombingmagazine.com. Um, and then uh, just if you have anything you know funny happen, just click in the chat. I'm gonna go there. There's somebody's got a, a thing right now. There's Catherine saying hi. So hi back to you. Um, but yeah, if you have any kind of questions or just want to know more about what Jason does, um, just pop on in. So um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to Jason. He is an American architect who lives in London. He's been uh, mudlarking for nine years, as I just asked him on the um, video chat. Um, he is in the Society of Thames Mudlarks, which means he is allowed to go out on the Thames with a shovel and a little um, you know, tools. Like if you go there, you have to get a permit and you just can only look at what you see on the surface. But um, Jason has found some really cool things. He's a trustee at the Thames Museum, which displays some of those items. He has some of his finds on permanent display in museums. Um, <clears throat> most famously, he writes for Beachcombing Magazine. Hold on one second. I'm going to close my window. <laughs> Sorry, the police are after me. Just kidding, there's some siren. Um, so Jason writes for Beachcombing Magazine. He writes for Treasure Hunting and The Searcher. Um, he is a speaker. He has spoken at Nazca before. He is the co-author of a book called Thames Mudlarking, Searching for London's Lost Treasures. And he's an all around great guy. We are so happy to have you here, Jason. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your video and thanks for meeting all these people. So. Uh, if you have anything you want to say about what you've been up to and the video and how fun that was, it'd be great. Oops, you're mute again. There you are. Yeah, sorry. I've got really bad okay. Wi-Fi here, so I might cut in and out. No uh, worries. So I missed a bit of your, your introduction. but You're uh, awesome. Yeah. That's what I said. <laughs> Thank you. So cool. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. I have a quick question. Like when you go out at night, so you said you go out at night um, because the tide is really low at this time of year, but do you find different things at night? Like, is it easier with a flashlight to see your shiny gold coins or what do you think? Yeah, I, I tend to get distracted very quickly during the daytime, but at night, because you've just got a pool of light that uh -huh. you have to focus on. It kind of helps me to kind of stay focused and look at a specific area rather than normally my eyes are kind of going in two different directions, uh, looking around and always this. So I think it helps me focus a little bit better at night. That's cool. Um, we have a couple questions. Um, you, I, you have like a, a headlamp. Do you have a particular one that you like? Have you? Do you have like 10 of them depending or? 
So originally, uh, I didn't have much money when I first started windlarking. And so I just got like the, the uh, cheap one at the dollar store, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which lasted, well, I bought about five of them because they kind of conked out after maybe three sessions. But now I paid like 15 pounds, so probably about $20 to get a proper one. And it has five lights. Um, so you can kind of have a blast of light. Uh, unfortunately, I don't remember the name of my my uh, head torch that I have, but I can share that with you guys later. Very cool, very cool. So somebody asked, uh, Tamara asked, do you prefer day or nighttime mudlarking? So it kind of depends. Uh, there's a lot of people out during the day. So I quite enjoy going at night just because you have a lot fewer people. And also because in the summer tides, uh, the tide goes a lot further out. So therefore you have uh, access to some of these historical areas that you normally never have access to. So I love the kind of the calmness of the night. As you saw, there's a lot of boats on the Thames. Uh, they blare music. So you can have like a little party as you're mudlarking <laughs> as well. Um, so good. I do prefer night larking, uh, but yeah, during the day is is equally as good. But I so Jason, night larking. is it getting real popular? Like you said, during the day, more people are doing it. Uh, yeah, it, it kind of depends on the area. So some areas are absolute hot spots during the day, and I avoid those. But at night, uh, they're relatively quiet. So most of the places that I took you. Uh, during this session, I don't go to during the day because it's a bit overcrowded. Uh, but at night, the, there's plenty of space for everyone. So it's overcrowded with mudlarks? Yeah, I mean, when 20 people are looking at the same exact spot, uh, you don't really have much of a chance to find something uh, because you're kind of stumbling over each other. But I mean, the foreshore is massive. It's the largest uh, and longest archaeological site in Britain. Um, wow. So it's huge, but there's certain hot spots, uh, for instance, in central London that I tried to avoid during the day. So when when the tide is all the way up, does it hit those walls of like along the Thames? Yeah, it goes all the way up about uh, oh. it's the hi height of a two story building. <gasps> so wow. it's, it's really the extreme tide. It, it's much different than you experience here in America. Um, yeah. And it's, then it's, when it's, it goes out, how how wide is the foreshore like at the uh, lowest I, I would say uh in some locations up to 100 feet oh my gosh yeah wow. so it, it's extreme it yeah. goes up uh i don't know the exact translation but in uh meters it's seven to ten meters twice a day mm -hmm. which wow. is roughly the size of a two-story building that's how much the water goes up and down yeah and what's your window of opportunity to, to uh mudlark at night with the tides or the day, I guess. Good to see you, Roxanne. Nice to see you too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so normally what I do is I go out for about three hours. Uh, so I go about two hours before low tide and one hour after low tide. So that's kind of the, the window of opportunity. Okay. And, and you had mentioned that um, the North Shore is restricted to those associated with the museum. Is that correct? Um, so the North Shore is heavily restricted because that's where the oldest part of the civilization is. So it's about 2,000 years old in that area, and that's why it's heavily protected. So no one, even if you have a permit, you're not allowed to scrape, dig, or disturb the surface at all. It's only the 50 of us that are part of the Society of Thames Mudlarks that are allowed to actually uh, scrape, dig, use metal detectors, etc., because we record everything with the uh, Museum of London. And we've built up a good rapport and uh, a lot of trust with them. Wow, phenomenal! What an opportunity! Yeah, yeah so many, really cool. many books have actually been written about these uh, mudlarking finds along the North Bank because it's it's quite incredible uh, what the mudlarks have found over the last forty years, and specifically pewter toys like children's toys. They have found thousands upon thousands of these pewter toys, which previously historians thought that children didn't really have a, a childhood, meaning they didn't have play things where they were allowed to play and, and be active in that manner. And these toys, the vast quantity of these toys has proved the historians wrong, that they did really had a, a vibrant childhood and that the parents were purchasing toys uh, for kids even back in medieval times. That's pretty cool. 
Um, somebody asked if you have a historical background, like are you a historian or you just learn here on the job? <laughs> So I pretty much say that I, uh, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from Britain originally. Um, so I've learned everything from the Thames. The Thames is a great history book and everything you find, you kind of take it home. And I spend like three to four hours mudlarking. And then I spend about eight hours just researching the finds that I found that day. So I spend more time behind the computer, just looking things up rather than uh, being on the foreshore. Um, so I don't have like a history degree or background. I've always been interested in history, always been interested in archaeology, but I, I haven't been trained as such. It's just a passion. Yeah. So the um, you're part of this group of 50. Um, does any, are there, who's policing? Like, do they ever check your permit or do you go through a course or how did, how did you become one of these um, members of this exclusive group? Yeah, so originally you have to get a license from the Port of London Authority just to be able to go mudlarking. And then you put your name on the waiting list to get into the Society of Thames Mudlarks. And the Museum of London kind of monitors and makes sure that you're actually actively recording everything that you find. And then uh, as positions become available, because it's limited to 50 people, as okay. some people either leave or, yeah, uh, or uh, just yeah, leave the group, then more spaces become available. So I would say there are about maybe three to five people that are let into the group every year. Um, and I waited for about six years to get into the group. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. Somebody asked you mudlark in the rain. Uh, snow, rain, it doesn't stop me. My wife, I'm crazy, but uh, yeah, you just want to get out there, the fresh air, the experience. Uh, some of my best finds are in really bad weather. I found a beautiful Roman coin in the middle of a snowstorm one day, so. Wow, that's very cool. Yeah. And are there other places that you've been mudlarking? I'm asking some of the questions in the chat, so it's not all my questions, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so oh, in. In the UK, uh, there are a lot of tidal rivers, uh, but for instance, in Bristol and up in um, Newcastle, it's a very, very muddy, like literally you'd sink up to your neck in the mud. So it's not very advantageous uh, or it's very dangerous to go mudlarking along other rivers in the UK. Uh, London's quite good because as you get into central London, it's quite pebbly, rocky, and gravelly. So you don't sink in the deep mud. If you go out into the Thames estuary, uh, there's a lot of uh, very thick, deep mud, and you have to be careful. Um, so yes, there's other places in the UK, but uh, it is quite dangerous uh, in other locations. So I have two questions. The first you mentioned for uh, tide, low tide, low tide. So is that uh, any different the seasons of the lowest tide, like um, in summer or winter? Is that different? Yeah. Good to see you, Ling. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> Are you in California? Yes. Uh, it's nice. uh, early morning. Yes, yeah, early I can morning. imagine. <laughs> yeah. Kiersey's there as well. So yeah. Santa Cruz area. Yeah. Oh. Um, so the, the best tides are in the spring. So we say spring tides. Mm -hmm. uh, it's based on the lunar cycles as well. And the day tides are very good in the springtime. So pretty much from February up until April, uh, we have very good uh, day tides. And the best night tides are pretty much from, I would say, July until October. Uh, so at the moment is, is when it's going to go very low. Uh, where it actually goes kind of, we say it's a minus tide, which is the, the extreme low. That's cool. Thank you. And the yeah. second question is about, uh, um, through the YouTube you shared, just uh, present uh, moments ago, and you and your friends, uh, the Malaki, and uh, you were amazed to what you found, and you learned what says about, uh, for example, like a 16, uh, 10 or 16 or 17th century or something. But I am so surprised and amazed how you know at the first sight and you know those the historians. So that's uh, so my question is that uh, when you want to Malark, you want to have those uh, history background or your knowledge first, then you go to the Malark or you uh, through your experience and you learn more. 
yeah, I, I didn't know much when I started. It's mm -hmm. all just because of learning with each find. So now that I've been doing it for nine years, I know what most things are, but I prefer to be surprised. So for instance, that Sardinian coin that you saw mm -hmm. me find, I didn't have a clue what that was until I uh, searched online when I got home after I cleaned it up. And I was very surprised that it was dated 1783 and was from Sardinia, which kind of shows that the old trade routes all came back to London or uh, some sailor had brought that in from, from Sardinia back in the 18th century. So uh, I, I love to be surprised and I love to learn new things. Um, most things I can identify quite quickly now though. Jason, you. what's your most popular, or I guess your most favorite find ever in all those years? Yeah, so uh, I think you probably saw it in a previous presentation, but it's a Roman hairpin that's carved in the bust of a woman. And that would have been used to kind of secure a woman's hair back uh, 2000 years ago. And the Museum of London asked uh, for me to donate that and I happily gave that to them. And it's now on permanent display in their museum in the Roman gallery. So that's, that's the dream, that's the thrill of, of, of mudlarking is to actually have something that's in the museum. So cool. Well, tell us about the Thames Museum. Yeah, so we have a series of events coming up and thank you, Kiersey, for putting that in the magazine. Yeah, no, those um, sound so out. fun. I wish I could come. <laughs> yeah. So the Thames Museum, it's still kind of a very initial concept, but what we've been doing is a series of exhibitions around London. So we've been at the British Museum, we've been at the Tate Modern Museum. This year, we're gonna be at St. Paul's uh, Cathedral, which is the, one of the most iconic sites in London. And we're also doing an exhibition at the Cutler's Hall, which is a beautiful old ancient building that, uh, that the society dates back to the 12th century. So what we've been doing is just a lot of pop-up exhibitions around London. And the end game is to build our own museum or find a building where we can incorporate a museum and display these things permanently. It's very cool. Yeah, so it's all about education. We want to share this information, not kind of keep it in our own kind of dusty cupboards at home. Uh, we want it to be on public display so people can see it and learn from it. And uh, yeah, just let future generations uh, learn from what we find. So Jason, Catherine asks um, if she can, uh, where she could buy um, your book and if it would be possible to get signed copies, like if she could contact you somehow to give those as gifts to friends. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to just uh, send me a direct message on Instagram, uh, feel free to do that. And I'm happy to sign a copy and even sign a uh, seal it with my wax seal uh, that I found on the Thames That's and so cool. send that to you. No problem. Cool. So yeah, so just uh, if you aren't on Instagram and you can't get a hold of him, you could get, I, just contact me through beachcombingmagazine.com and I'm happy to um, forward you to his email. So Okay, so, Tamara says, what's the weirdest or strangest thing you found? <laughs> yeah, um, unfortunately, uh, we do find uh, dead bodies down Ooh. in the Thames. Yeah, and last, last year when I was, uh, well, I found three before uh, co complete bodies. Uh, last year nice. I found uh, the femur of some person. And so I had to call the police again. This was while I was night larking. It was about 2 a.m. Um, so I didn't want to wait around for the police to come. So I just left it by the back wall, the river wall. Uh, so the police called me the next day, said they couldn't find it. So I had to give them directions how to find it. And they oh bagged gosh. it and took it away. And I think you've probably seen uh, Nick Stevens found a complete skeleton of a 12 year old girl from the 18th century. Wow. And that was uh, professionally excavated by an archeological society here in London and researched. And they were able to find out a lot about her just from doing the, um, not DNA test, but uh, carbon dating and other tests to the isotope test. Uh, so it's quite interesting. They were able to figure out that she had some kind of tooth decay, which indicated malnutrition, uh, lack of a good diet, um, and she had rickets as a child. Um, so all of these things we think uh, led to her early death at age 12 back in oh. the 18th century. So your wife is an author. So when is she going to write your mudlarking mystery book? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to convince her, but uh, okay. yeah. Keep working but, uh, on it. 
Yeah, her books, uh, they are about uh, a curator from the British Museum. That's kind of her protagonist. So she does have that. And she has interviewed people at both the British Museum and Museum of London. So there is kind of a parallel strand there, but not nothing to do with it. Okay, we'll work on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Her fans it demand like, it. Could be like a Da Vinci Code kind of thing. Yeah, Ooh, exactly. All the way back to Roman times. All right, exactly. this practically writes itself. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, are the you, there's the fifty of you who are the you know the elite crowd, and then there's tons of people who just come for maybe one day their whole life, or um, is there a general sense of camaraderie or competition, or how, what is it like between you guys? Uh, so generally, it's a really great bunch of people, and we're all very good friends. And, and like I mentioned, we're having these exhibitions coming up, and I have over 50 mudlarks involved, and they're all kind of displaying their own personal collections, which is uh, quite astounding, because normally they're kind of in dusty cupboards, as I was mentioning previously. So obviously, there is competition sometimes between people, and there are certain people that don't get along with the rest of us. Um, so yeah, I'm sure that's true of the beachcombing community as it well. It is everywhere, it's, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, but in general, there, it's a good good bunch, and and a lot of times great. we go for lunch or for a bite to eat after uh, mudlarking together. So it's good to kind of compare finds and learn from each other, and and just kind yeah. of yeah. That's great. Um, so since I did mention your wife being an author, someone has asked, "What's her name, and where can they find her books?" <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Yeah, her name is Rose Sandy, so S A N D Y, and the books are also available on Amazon. Or you can—they're really her... fun, you guys. I have read a bunch of them. So, oh, have you? Oh, yeah, my... oh yeah, they're yeah, fascinating. Mentioned... I it was I I know her life experience has has informed a lot of her writing, so it's very mm. fun. I feel yeah. like I'm traveling around the world, so <laughs> very fun. Yeah, jungles and cities, and <laughs> so. Yeah, fun, fun, fun. Um, so has there, oh, someone asked, Eileen asked, has a value ever been estimated for anything you've found? Are they priceless or worth hundreds or what's your, anything? Yeah, I uh, haven't really gotten too much estimated because I'm not really interested in the value of things. Um, the only thing that is probably my most, not precious find, but probably worth a lot of money uh, which is uh, when I had it, I checked online to see what comparative price was. And it was like over $2,000. Uh, wow. And this is a coin from the 17th century that was only produced for about two weeks. It was only in circulation oh. for two weeks. So it's wow. super, super rare. And it was probably somebody that because they produced them and then couldn't use them, they probably dumped them into the Thames. Uh, oh. So I'm one of the only people that ever found one of these. Um, and hence, they're super rare and, and quite valuable. But I mean, some things are worth over fifty, sixty thousand uh, wow. dollars. Uh, but yeah, but that's not why we go down there. And also, everything that we find is technically owned by the Crown Estate. Uh, so the Crown Estate is the Queen, the Queen of England. So I'm just waiting for her to give me a call and invite me to Buckingham Palace. And Definitely. I'll, give back, <laughs> I'll give back all of her lost property that I found in the river. So. Yeah. Very good. But when it, whenever we donate something, we need permission from the Crown Estate to give it to museum. And technically anything that you, you shouldn't be selling these things anyways. But if it's sold, uh, they also have should be a beneficiary of that. Um, so yeah, it's her property. So technically it's- That's it's, nice of you to hold it. it for her, to clean it off exactly. for her. Exactly, <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, someone asked, let's see, Tamara asks, if you like mudlarking by yourself or with other people, is it your quiet time or is it a group effort? Yeah, so I prefer going at least with one other friend because uh, sometimes, especially at night, uh, it can be a bit dangerous. Um, people have been hurt in the past, uh, especially when you're, there's a lot of people along the Thames path and they could be drunk or they, they could be sitting on the river mm -hmm. wall with their uh, beer glass and they chuck it at you. I've had things thrown at me before. Nice. Um, so it's always best to kind of go, especially at night with, with a friend or with a few other people. During the day, it's less of an issue, but it's still sometimes a bit, a bit scary. Um, I 
found one of the dead bodies when I was alone and that kind of traumatized me uh, for a <laughs> yeah, while. I yeah. I Is it slippery out there? You've got, what kind of equipment do you have? Uh, so typically I wear like rubber boots. Uh, we call them wellies in the UK. Uh, I wear gloves most of the time, as you saw during the video, um, because I am allowed to, I take a small hand rake to kind of just kind of disturb the surface because a lot of things are just kind of tucked under the surface of the pebbles. Um, and otherwise, uh, definitely a tide map so that you know exactly when the low tide will be and when the high tide's gonna come in um, and a watch so you can monitor the tide as well. Yeah, that's good. And a torch. Have you ever taken yeah. down a UV flashlight to see if anything glows down there or? I haven't personally. I only found out through your magazine that these things do glow, the, the UV glass. Yeah, a lot of stuff glows yeah. though, so beware. So, <laughs> it could be the sewage could oh, glow. Really? Who knows? <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, we don't want to see that. <laughs> so you said yeah. that the, the um, river still is, it is a pollution dump, but, you know, so people do, it still gets sewage in the rain. Yeah, un unfortunately, uh, the sewer system here is still the Victorian system, so it's over 100 years old. Um, yeah. So at the moment, uh, the city is building a whole new sewer system. It's called the super sewer, and it <laughs> will be able to hold all of the overflow. But at the moment, as a default, when we get a heavy mm -hmm. downpour and the sewage system can't cope, then it dumps directly into the Thames, which is a real yeah. nightmare. So as, as you mentioned in my introduction, um, I'm an architect. And we did a luxury uh, re residential development, and it's right near the Thames. And I think you probably heard a month ago, we had some very bad floods in London. Yeah. Uh, it was high tide, so the overflow couldn't go into the Thames. So it backed up the sewer system and flooded our basement with raw sewage. Oh. So, yeah, it was awful. And people had precious artwork down in their storage units. They had luxury cars down in the basement. So it's a huge insurance claim. Uh, at the moment, just because of this uh, backup of the, yeah. uh, of the sewage system. It's similar here in the Great Lakes. There's uh, like Chicago has the same problem where the storm flow and the sewage are all in the same system. So yeah, yeah. So hopefully in the future, they'll have a separate system once the super sewer is done. So is there any worry about um, sea rise in London and the tides? Has it changed at all? Do you know? Uh, not really that I'm aware of. A few decades ago, they built uh, the Thames Barrier, which uh, can be closed, and that makes sure that the uh, flood, so as the tide comes in, that it can't flood London, because there used to be a lot of uh, flooding within central London. So uh, to my knowledge, there haven't been any floods any time recently in the past two decades because of that barrier. Is the, does the tide come in quickly? Tamara asked. She lives in the Bay of Fundy in Canada, which has the, the, some of the highest tidal changes. And it yeah. comes in so fast, it's a wave. So how- A wave, wow. Yeah, there's, that's dangerous. I saw it wow. once. It was very wow. fun. Yeah, I yeah. mean, at certain times of the year. Yeah, fortunately, uh, the tide goes out quite slowly, but then it does come in quite quickly. That's why I was uh, telling Roxanne earlier, like I go about two, three hours before low tide, and then I only have like a short window after low tide. So about one hour, and then I need to take the ladder or the steps up to the top of the river wall because it does come in quite quickly. So it's pretty shallow, like a, a, not a very steep. No, yes, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's quite shallow, yeah. Okay, yeah. so if it comes up one you, inch, it goes in a foot or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't come in in waves. I've never seen a, a wave. Yeah, and then, so things like the sea glass that's there, or beach glass, it's it's still pretty sharp, right, in the pottery? Yeah, as you saw with uh, Nicholas Thames fish, uh, most of them are broken jars that don't have much kind of uh, soft edges mm -hmm. or even the kind of um, translucent surface. It's still quite clear. Mm -hmm. Um, that's just the nature of it. Those it, red it and yellow been... pieces were awesome. They look I pretty know, frosty to me. I know, yeah. <laughs> well, those are All cool because they're actually from ships and from the, she was saying ship's lanterns, you yeah, know, they would have yeah. been circular yeah. to kind of signal between ships. So I thought that was quite cool Very that we found beautiful. some. We yeah. would love to find those here. Oh, <laughs> what a prize. Yeah. Yeah. 
She, sh she should have entered them in the contest. <laughs> we have the photo contest tomorrow. So oh yeah, everybody nice. will get to see all kinds of really cool pieces. But yeah, that was very fun watching her just like she picks up a piece and goes, well, of course, this is a fish head and this is a exactly. fin. Exactly. You know? Yeah, she already Obviously. knows where it's going to go. And it was yeah. great to see her kind of lay it out on the foreshore right there in front of me. Yeah, I didn't realize it goes so quickly. So she has yeah. a really good idea as soon as she finds a piece. Yes. Yeah. So when Anna picked up, there was like a, a the pipe bowl and she's like, oh yeah, this is probably 1610 to 1640. Like, was there a limited time that those pipes were made or does she just know? Um, most of the times we can tell how old the pipe is based on the size of the bowl. So oh, okay. uh, back in the late 16th century, so America was just being founded at that time where the English colonization was just uh, being established. Mm -hmm. And that's when they started importing the tobacco back to London. So from Jamestown, Jamestown succeeded as uh, the first permanent settlement, uh, British settlement in the United States, just because of the tobacco trade. Um, so as you can imagine, the tobacco was very expensive back then. So the pipe bowls were very small in order to just accommodate just a little bit, a few leaves of tobacco. Whereas as uh, the trade progressed, it became more established, uh, the price of tobacco dropped. And so therefore you could afford to put more tobacco in your pipes. So the pipe bowls got bigger. So normally the bigger the pipe bowl, it means it's quite young. Whereas the smaller the pipe bowl, it's quite old and dating back to the, the late 16th, early 17th century. And the, the pipes were the cigarettes of the day where you bought the pipe with the tobacco already in it, right? Yeah, a lot of times that was the case. Yeah, it was pre-filled. And then pre -filled. they just chucked it in the river. Yeah, that's why we find thousands of them. That's amazing. Some yeah. of them are so beautiful and very highly decorated. Would those be ones that people would use again and again? I think so, yeah, yeah. definitely, yeah. yeah. They are gorgeous. Um, have you, okay, somebody, Eileen asked, have you ever found anything prehistoric? Uh, yes, we find a lot of kind of uh, flint tools. So they've been carefully napped. Uh, so kind of uh, knocked on the side, flaked off, mm -hmm. and then they make kind of arrowheads, uh, spearheads, all different types of instruments, uh, scrapers, uh, monoliths. Uh, things of that nature. So those are some of the oldest uh, man-made tools and uh, artifacts that we find. The oldest things that we find are obviously fossils uh, that date back 200 million years old, et cetera. What kind of fossils are there? Uh, we do find ammonites. I would say probably the uh, oh. most common thing that we find are the fossilized uh, sea urchins. So the macrasters, uh, which I love them. They're almost like heart-shaped uh, yeah, stones, those are cool. and they have the, it's almost like a sand dollar, the kind mm -hmm. of impression on the top. Uh, those are gorgeous. I, I love yeah, finding those. Cool. Very cool. Um, uh, Marie, you can ask your question too, Marie. I don't have to ask it for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay though. She says, I learned about pipe sizes from a show on Netflix called Detectorist. Great show, very informative yeah. and very funny filmed in England. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah, that was very. Yeah, Have you seen it, Jason? It's a really yeah. good show. Yeah, yeah, it's hilarious. The the guys yeah. is just so funny. Yeah, and the, they they show it how it is. You know, they they just find yeah. like pull tabs off of a can instead of like a gold artifact. They, yeah. they show you how it actually is. So. so it's metal detectors. Primarily, yeah, metal detectors. Very yeah, cool. but it's hilarious. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, is there anything on your like bucket list, Jason, that you would just love to find but haven't yet? Uh, one thing that's still on my bucket list is like a Roman brooch. I absolutely love the kind of Roman period. Mm -hmm. And the Romans were in London from pretty much 43 AD all the way up to 426 AD. Oh, so wow. for about 400 years, they lived and uh, developed the early colony and London was established by the Romans. So I'd love to find one of these uh, beautiful kind of dolphin brooches or yeah. uh, finial brooches. And I think you published a few of them last year, if you remember. Yeah. Uh, my friend Judy Hazel found one uh, last January, not this past one, but the year before. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're still out there. I just haven't found one yet. Get out there, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jason, do you know if there's any like 
anything equivalent in the United States, like in New York or Boston, you know, mudlarking, finding you know, historical things? Yeah, uh, I don't know both of their names. Do you know Scott and his wife? I forget what her name is. They're kind of in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. and, and they find a lot of kind of art deco, like mm -hmm. early 20th century finds. Like we've but, been here, like could, could we go to Jamestown and go mudlarking or, <laughs> you know? I have no clue. I'd love yeah. to find out though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be fun. Yes, Marie? I see a hand. Did you have um, a greater opportunity in 2020 because of COVID to get out there when there wasn't a lot of people maybe out there or did people converge because it was outside? Uh, so they actually shut down the foreshore during COVID. So we weren't oh. allowed to go out. Some people went out anyways and nobody was really policing it. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of obeyed the rules uh, during the first oh. lockdown and didn't go out. Um, so yeah, it was a bit of a shame that we lost that period of time and couldn't go out. Uh, but in the second and third lockdowns, they didn't officially close the foreshore. So we were allowed to go out. So that was very calm and peaceful. And actually in my local area, I found more people out on the foreshore, not looking for anything specific, but just kind of walking the dog because you couldn't leave your house except for one hour to exercise. So that was their exercise. It's just to kind of walk oh, along wow. the foreshore at low tide with the dog or just uh, take the kids out for a walk and just a bit of a change of scenery. So it was uh, an oasis of calm, but technically we weren't supposed to be mudlarking during that time period. Is it, it looks really rocky. It doesn't look like a place you'd take your dog. Is it, are there portions of it that are sandy or? Yeah, I mean, it kind of changes terrain wherever you are in London. So there's some areas where there's so much sand that you have like uh, professional uh, sand castle makers. Oh, wow. Uh, doing things on the, the beach and people, uh, do you sometimes go swimming in the Thames? Previously, it was kind of a, a public beach there at the Tower of London. Oh, um, oh, that's right. Yeah. So people do use it. I mean, you see a lot of dog walkers down there. And it's just a place to escape and see London from a different perspective and uh, get some headspace. So is it quiet down there or? It really is. And I love the sound of the seagulls and the waves. And you just feel like you're outside of London, even though you're in the, the heart of London. Um, so yeah, it's just a great place to escape to. That's very cool. It's not as uh, calm and serene as your beautiful beaches. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they're very crowded too, especially during all the lockdowns. <laughs> they were very oh, popular. Yeah. But I heard um, they closed your beaches as well, didn't they? In yeah, they did at the very beginning. Yeah. They, they actually closed it from like nine to five. And so if you were a local, you, you could go at five, but. Okay. Yeah, or, or, and then it switched to, it's open to everyone, but you can't sit down. You gotta be moving. <laughs> Strange. Well, Very so you bizarre. can't set up your chairs and your umbrella. It was like, go there for exercise or to go swimming or surfing, but not just sit there. So okay, we'll see what happens. Um, Roberta said that she's found human molars in Lake Erie. Is she supposed to report them or do you have rules in London? What, what happens if you find a bone or a skull or whatever? Yeah, so I don't think you need to report uh, teeth uh, because I, the, sometimes they just naturally fall out anyways. Uh, but if you do find like a piece of a human bone, like a skull or, or arm or femur, like I did last year, you definitely need to report those. Um, they are quite rare, but there's mm -hmm. a lot of bones on the Thames foreshore. Because as you can imagine, there have been pubs, taverns, inns, slaughterhouses, tanneries, um, skinners, all along the river for centuries. And they would just throw all of their animal bones into the Thames. So in some locations, the, the bones are stacked up about two to three inches thick. Ooh. That's how many bones. And they just cover literally everything. So the police are getting calls all the time about, oh, I found a human bone. But most of them are just animal bones. Um, so when I called last year and said I found a human bone, a femur, they said, uh, we get these calls all the time. Uh, can you please send us a photograph? And I said, I'm absolutely sure it's a human bone. And I sent a photograph and they said, yes, that is a human bone. And then they went to pick it up. But they get a lot of uh, false calls uh, all the time because there's just so many bones down there. Oh, that's crazy. How about weapons? Eileen asks, 
uh, old or current weapons? Yeah, so there have been quite a few pistols that have been found. Uh, I think that one of the oldest ones that's very interesting is a flintlock pistol from the 18th century, mm -hmm. uh, which is really cool. And the, the Thames mud is anaerobic, so it perfectly preserves these wood artifacts as well. Um, so it was in pristine condition when it came out of the mud. Uh, so that's one of the best guns that have been found in the Thames. But we do find a lot of knives. I've even seen the police uh, down there with metal detectors under bridges searching for um, uh, weapons uh, because they need the, 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 yeah, for the court case, they need to find the murder weapon. So that's a bit scary when you see the police down there with metal yeah. detectors, but that's, oh, I've, that's only happened to me once. I want you to find a jewel encrusted gold sword, okay? <laughs> Ooh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How about that anchor? You didn't want to bring that home? A bit too heavy. <laughs> too heavy. I couldn't show you the scale of it, but it was as tall as I am. It was huge. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> massive. It wasn't that old, but some of them are several hundred years old. Um, uh, Tamara asked, do you have a favorite era of things that you like to find? So you had mentioned maybe Roman or is that your... Yeah, I love kind of Roman, medieval, and also 17th century uh, because my uh, ancestors sailed from England in 1638 and arrived in 1639 and started a colony in uh, on Long Island in 1640. So I love anything from that time period because in my family, we have no heirlooms from that time period. So anything I find from that time period, I'm like, yes. This you just is pretend like my, it's yours. <laughs> well, my, my ancestors could have had this coin in their pockets or the kids are playing with that toy so yeah you just never know do you have a lot of coins in your collection or those little tokens or i do yes quite a few it's fun those are nice and better than an anchor to bring <laughs> home <laughs> a little true, easier true. <laughs> um do you ever take anybody on trips to go mudlarking or so technically I need a, a license to do trips. Um, so what I do is I recommend that people go with the Thames Discovery Program or with the Thames Explorer Trust. Mm -hmm. And they do kind of guided tours on almost a weekly basis now that COVID is kind of slowly dissipating. Mm -hmm. um, during lockdown, there were no tours, uh, but as part of this uh, September uh, month of events, we're doing several foreshore tours. And the great thing about these tours is uh, you pay a very nominal fee. I think it's only like $5 to go on the tour. And you don't need a permit to go because you're with a licensed archaeologist. And they kind of tell you exactly what you find. So they identify things and you're allowed to take things home. Uh, so that, that's the best way oh. to kind of get into mudlarking very quickly is just go on one of these guided tours, which are super informative. And those happen not just during this special event, but year round. No, yeah. If you check their websites, uh, it's very easy to, to book on there. I think maximum is my, maybe eight to 15 pounds, uh, depending on what day you're going, but they're, they're super informative, so I'd highly recommend them. So if you find something really old, do you leave it or do you, can you take it or do you, what, what would happen? Like um, if, if someone like me the, found something. <laughs> if you're on one of the guided tours, and you find something that's 300 years or older, uh, the tour guide would probably keep that and report that to the Museum of London. Uh, yeah. But like clay pipes and pottery, the museum is not really interested in seeing those because they have just too many of those. So you can definitely take that home, even if it's 300 years or older. Cool, cool, cool. Um, do they, are there people out there checking for your permit? Somebody asked earlier. Yeah, unfortunately uh, it's kind of self-policing so I've uh, been kind of asked to see my permit by many other mudlarks when they see me on the North Bank kind of scraping because that area is highly restricted. Right. So they asked to show that I'm a society member. And I've asked people as well when I don't recognize them from our 50 group of 50, I know yeah. that they're not supposed to be down there. So I say, listen, guys, you shouldn't be scraping or digging in this area. That's so it's great. kind of self-pleasing, which is a bit annoying because, uh, yeah. yeah, it does lead to a bit of conflict on the foreshore if somebody's doing something they shouldn't and a few other mudlarks are approaching them and telling them to stop, so. Yeah. Do you guys ever have any kind of meetings where you get together or? 
<laughs> yeah. So because of COVID, everything has been canceled. Um, and our next meeting is actually uh, in the next three weeks. So we meet typically four times a year uh, as a society. And it's really great because uh, Museum of London attends every time. They look at our new finds. They record them for us at the meeting. And then also typically we have like a lecture series. So we have different people coming in telling us about specific um, artifacts or groups of artifacts like pipes or coins or something else. Uh, so it's very informative and I learn, learn a lot and it's quite a large age group. Um, so we have like 20 year olds all the way up to 80 year olds in the group. Uh, so the seasoned mudlarks really do teach the younger kids a lot. Oh, that's good. And yeah. um, did you, uh, someone ask, Anne, and Anne asks, um, how did you become aware of mudlarking and get into it? Or did were you just walking around and go, hey, there's stuff here? Yeah, that's interesting because uh, I live along the river uh, in West London. And my kids at the time were very small uh, when I started taking them down to the foreshore. And I had no clue that you could find historical artifacts down there. Uh, we were just kind of flipping over rocks to look at the crabs kind of crawl out. And there's like little baby eels, uh, shrimp and other wildlife there. So I would take them down to throw walk rocks in the water and to look for wildlife. But I never imagined that you could find like ancient artifacts down there. So I was watching a show on the National Geographic channel called uh, Thames Treasure Hunters. This was back in 2012. And mm -hmm. that was my first introduction to mudlarking. And literally uh -huh. the next weekend, I went down searching uh, myself and found my first clay pipe. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> Like, for Americans, yeah, for Americans, we just don't have the, the ancient history no. like that. Uh, I did find growing up Indian arrowheads or Native American arrowheads in the plowed fields around my house. Uh, but that's kind of the only thing I ever found uh, locally that was of any, had any age to it. Have your kids caught the mudlarking bug or more beachcombing or... Uh, yeah, so and originally, yes, I think that's kind of fading now that they're kind of teenagers uh, mm -hmm. and less interested in what dad's doing. Yeah. But uh, thank you so much for inviting me two years ago to the Nazca Festival there in Wildwood. Uh, and if you remember, my son was presenting adorable with me and sharing some of his top finds. So <laughs> he, he absolutely loves it, but that's kind of slowly fading a little bit. So Yeah. Does it's your daughter great. like sea glass yet? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if you saw my post. We went to the Jurassic Coast yes. uh, over, uh, when was it? Uh, beginning of June, late May. And yeah. she had some uh, earrings made from the sea glass we found. Excellent. So, yeah, she loves, my, my wife hates mudlarking because she never finds anything. She, only, <laughs> she says she only finds rusty nails if she does mudlarking. <laughs> But she loves sea glass hunting because they're yeah. beautiful pieces and they're just beautifully yeah. rounded and shaped. Yeah. And so she's had, uh, she's going to have some jewelry made as well from what she's found. That's so great. She loves and sea glass did you hunting. find any uh, fossils on the Jurassic Coast? Or? Yeah, we found uh, lots of ammonites, the beautiful oh, kind of them. iron pyrite ammonites. Yeah, all oh, those are beautiful. Yeah, they, they look like they're man-made because they're just so perfect. Yeah. But uh, they are completely natural. So That's if you scary. guys ever come to the UK, you don't need a license to go fossil hunting and you, you're allowed to take anything you find with you. And it's a beautiful area of the country. I absolutely love it. You feel like you're a bit on Mars because uh, the, the landscape's so unusual, but there's beautiful coastal walks, uh, fossil hunting, sea glass hunting, and there's an old Victorian dump, which is eroding into the sea, which a lot of the broken bottles have now been tumbled. And so there's beautiful pieces of sea glass. So I'd highly recommend going there. Yes, Marie. I was supposed to go last year. Oh. It, oh. Yeah, I mean, it was just so heartbreaking. We had the whole trip planned. We were going to go to Jurassic Coast. We were going to go mudlarking. It, I mean, and even go up to see them. And oh, um, wow. of course, you know, everyone's plans uh, got canceled. But it was. Yeah. I'm listening to you talk about all this. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I know, I know. Hopefully still there. Yeah. It's You'll still there. Rebook. It's true. Yeah, it's There's some there. more fossils falling out of the walls and more glass exactly. from that dump. But yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's been really hard. Hey, hey, Jason, I have a random personal question. Do your kids speak with an English accent or American accent? They, they do. Yeah. Both my kids speak with a very cute English accent. Oh, that's, so, that's cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, they, they are adorable. In the oh, beautiful oh, kids. Yeah. It's from their mother. Just kidding, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did get a chance to meet Jason um, at last year's NASCA festival. Was anybody else there? Um, in, so two years uh, ago. Two years ago. Two years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. Last year yeah, was a blur. Right, yeah. So <laughs> Uh, his the his son was there and his family it was just great meeting with you and it's always so fun um, just seeing all the stuff that you find Jason and thank you for being so you know generous with your time and letting us pester you with questions but yeah no uh, problem it's all about the history and sharing it so yeah yeah I think it's great that exhibit that you guys are having so it's going to be a series of events one's at St. Paul's and there's going to be a certain number of mudlarks. And then the next one's at the Cutler's Hall. And it's going to be a different set of mudlarks. Is that right? Yeah. So every day is different. And every day is different mudlarks. So, so you'll cool. see a different collection. So if you're in London during that time period, I'd recommend coming every day. Because you're going to see different things. Let's and- go, everyone. <laughs> What's to stop us? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know. Well, we probably have some people from England on the on the zoom so hopefully they can go and check it out for us but yeah yeah yeah, take lots of pictures and we'll look so you guys be sure to follow jason on instagram and he also has a youtube channel and very fun adventures and jason uh you recently had a television show didn't you uh not a television show i was recording for channel four okay an episode Um, okay yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's gonna come out sometime this this fall and what is it about um, so they actually, I shouldn't be telling you this, but uh, they actually, Nobody so tell. keeps this to yourself. Uh, <laughs> so they came to my house and they uh, interviewed my two children about mudlarking, my wife about mudlarking. They had, I had a whole display out on the oh. table for them to uh, just look at. And then I took them night larking as well. Um, so you. they're doing a, an episode about uh, mudlarking in London. Okay, well, be sure to post it and we'll... Uh... We'll send it out to everyone. Will do. Um, And as you guys may know, Jason writes for Beachcombing Magazine, and you can find all of his articles on on the website. And in the most recent issue, he did one about buttons, which was amazing. How many buttons are found on the Thames? I was like, oh my gosh. So cool. So cool. And his articles are great because they share images from all the different mudlarks. It's not just stuff that Jason's found. Exactly. yeah. his friends who are really, really generous with their photos and stories too. So yeah. really, really appreciate it. So thank you. You know, I can't wait till we're back in person again. Roxanne is the um, organizer of the North American Sea Glass Festival events. And so um, tomorrow we're going to have an announcement of where we're going to be live in 2022. Yeah. So Ooh. yeah, but at the end any, of the day, tomorrow, hints? be sure to, to learn about that. <laughs> Okay. And um, Chris says, thank you so much for this. And Ling said she was in Wildwood also. And if you guys haven't had a chance to go to a festival in person, they are so much fun. You will be surrounded by people who love beachcombing, beach class, sea glass, pottery, mudlarking. Um, experts come and they share their collections at the show. People like Jason speak, which is so fun. And then if you're into sea glass, there's endless beautiful art and jewelry and uh, stuff that people make out of sea glass. So I do hope everybody can come next year. Um, Please look for our announcement tomorrow. I think we'll be pleased and we can't wait to get back together. I know, I know. Until then, this has been really fun. And thank you, Jason, so much. Thank you, Roxanne, for organizing things. It's been really fun. And I hope to see you guys again and find out about if you like doing events like this, find out about Beachcombing Club on our website at beachcombingmagazine.com. And Jason, any final words for us? Um, no, thank you so much for inviting me to speak and present uh, my night larking adventures. I hope you enjoyed seeing uh, both Anna and Nicola and myself out on the foreshore. And whenever you're in London, uh, feel free to look me up and I'll definitely give you some tips and places to go and not just mudlarking, but also museums to see and, and different attractions uh, in London. So thank you so much. It's been great. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And, and I'll look forward to seeing you guys in person next year. Yay. Thank you. All righty. Take Thanks care, everyone. Thanks, everyone.